Good morning, good morning. Come on in and sit down. Come on in and grab a seat. Welcome to Encore. If you're here or if you're watching online, welcome. We're just going to have us some fun today and pray, do some prayer, time in prayer and worship and time in the Word and some good community. But I wanted to start with a fun table talk question. Did you know that was coming? Well, let's give these people a chance to sit down. They're moving. It's fast. Don't move too fast. Okay, here we go. Here's our fun table talk question. So it's the day after President's Day, right? And I was going to ask who your favorite president was, but I decided that might create some big fights. So instead, here's, a, here's our fun table talk question for this morning. What was one of your favorite toys growing up as a kid? What was one of your favorite toys growing up as a kid? If you can remember back that far. The first one that came to my mind I got for Christmas when I was five or six, and it was this. Let's put up the Rock'em Sock'em. Oh, come on. Anybody remember Rock'em Sock'em Robots? My grandma and grandpa got me this. I was so excited. Oh, ah, ah, ah. so much fun. Okay, so what's your, one of your favorite toys growing up as a kid? I'll show you my favorite when we finish up. Look, I'll let you talk now. Okay, all right. I'm curious. A couple of you want to shout out uh, what one of your favorite toys was or somebody at your table? Yeah. Tinker Toys? Ooh, Tinker Toys. Oh, I remember what, what we had log cabin log toys. Lincoln Logs. Yeah, yeah, that was fun too. That was fun too. Okay, a couple more. Yeah. Gilbert Erector Set. Gilbert Erector Set. So you like to build things? A couple of kind. All right, okay. You're not sure now. Okay. One more, one more. Yeah. Right? Etch a sketch. Oh, I used to love that. Yeah. Until somebody would shake it up after I worked like two hours to make the letter G. Okay, so here's my favorite toy. Uh, I'm holding it a couple years ago. Okay, it'll take you a while to get the joke. All right. You'll shoot your eye out. All right, yes. But I do very, very I totally remember when my grandpa got me a Red Ryder BB gun for Christmas and my mom was freaked out. Uh, yeah, I'll actually, I'm thinking about bringing my Red Rider BB gun to uh, Encore next week. I'll don't tell security, all right? Okay, all right. Okay, so before I turn stuff over to Carol, Carolyn, does anybody have this week's verse? I'll be honest, I had some trouble memorizing it because I had a little bit different version of it in my head. Okay, I'm running to the back of the room. I'm running to the back of the room. Oh, oh. All the way to the... This is the first time we've had the back table ever have a verse. I had no idea you guys were even listening. Okay. So here we go. All right. Luke 10, 27. And he said, and he answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Luke 10, 27. Ooh, well done. Okay, so Starbucks or Woods? Starbucks it is. There you go. All right. Man, that is such, a, such an important, important verse. So, Carolyn, are you almost ready? I'm going to turn stuff over to you then, girl. Passing the baton, I see. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Well, we survived, we survived Valentine's Day. Whew. Next one is what? St. Patrick's Day? For all you Irishmen who aren't Irish. Are, what, what do they say about that day? Everybody's Irish on St. Everybody's Irish on St. Patrick's Day? Yeah. Anyway, um, before we go any further, would you please make sure that you've turned off your cell phones or silenced them so we won't be interrupted? Thank you. 
Um, I'm so glad to be here today. I know Pastor Jeff's glad to be here today. And let's wave hi to everybody in YouTube land. Woohoo! Come and join us when you can. We miss you guys. Okay. A little announcement about our snacks. There aren't many today. So you know the drill. You know what I'm going to say. So I'll say it anyway. Okay. Those people who like to eat... Please bring food. If you don't like to eat, you probably can bring food too. Either way, just let's load up those tables every week. And then when we're done our little service here, please make sure that you take your plates home with you. Thank you. That's just a little housekeeping thing we need to keep up. All right. So I have a um, first time visitor here today. As a matter of fact, it's a couple. Let's say hi to Art and Diane Jackson. Art and Diane, where are you sitting so we can welcome you? Woohoo! Where's your, over here, okay. Nice to see you, welcome aboard. We're glad you're here. Okay. So today is um, a special day. It's called National Cherry Pie Day. Okay, so there's a little history there about a cherry pie and cherries in general. And it's kind of interesting how this National Day today is so close to President's Day, which was yesterday. Because you've heard the old myth a story about George Washington, right? Everybody's heard that one about chopping down the cherry tree. And his dad, he was a little boy, I guess, when he did this. And so his dad asked him, and he said, Dad, I cannot lie. I cut down that tree. And what was his dad's reaction? Your honesty is more important to me than any tree. That was a pretty cool lesson, so keep that in mind, okay? Don't go chopping down any cherry trees, but go have a piece of cherry pie today, okay? So let's do our prayer requests. Let's pray for Anita. She's not here today. She's having some health issues, not just her shoulder, but she's got some other things going on. So let's lift her up and pray for he healing for her. A prayer request from Roger and Penny Decker. They're not here today because they have a doctor's appointment, but they wanted me to announce and remind you of the celebration of Life Memorial for their daughter, Miriam, this coming Saturday, February 24th, in the Student Center at 11 o'clock. So those who can attend, please come and support uh, them. This is a prayer request from Cheryl Cranson. Prayer for Brian McDonald for healing. He's in ICU and is doing, not doing well. This is a life-threatening situation. So let's keep uh, Brian in our prayers, please. Here's a prayer request for the Lord to direct Jenny and Ted to the right people at the credit bureaus who will help correct errors on their credit reports and credit score instead of passing the buck or sending them letters that don't apply to their problem. So let's pray for Jenny and Ted in this situation. This is a prayer request from Bob Dean. Please keep praying for God to provide a job for him soon. Let's keep Bob in our prayers. A prayer request from Donna and Sharon. Our almost 103-year-old Auntie Vi was just released from the hospital about a, after a bout with pneumonia. She's back in it again. She has pneumonia and also a kidney infection. Please pray for healing and that she will not be released prematurely this time. Can you imagine 103 years old? Bless her heart. So let's keep Auntie Vi in our prayers. <clears throat> Here's a prayer request from Lori Galt. Please pray for a good consult Thursday with cardiologists for some irregularities. So let's keep Lori in our prayers as well. And here's a prayer request from Mary Nell. Please pray for Maggie's surgery at 1.30 today. Here's a prayer request for God to bless a homeschool class for the kids I will teach in the fall, that the Holy Spirit would draw the kids' heart and prepare us all to know him and love him more. That's a great prayer request. So let's pray for that person. Is a prayer request. 
please pray for my husband. I think it's trig anger. He is going for a knee surgery tomorrow. Pray for the surgeon and that he will have a successful surgery. And I miss this at the beginning. This is a praise from Marilyn Mitchell. Many thanks to Bonnie for calling to check up on me since I missed a few times because of shoulder surgery. What a wonderful ministry. So let, let's praise the Lord for that one, okay, from Marilyn. Okay. That's all the prayer requests and praises I have for today. So I'm asking Larry Burnell, would you please come on up and pray for us? And please continue to pray for Israel's peace and for our country and for our leaders to lean on the Lord's leading. Thank you very much. Love you guys. God bless you. Love you most. Let's go ahead and pray. Thank you, Lord, for this new day you've given us together. And we ask your blessing over Encore this morning and, and to take care of the needs of those that have been held up before your throne, Lord. We trust them uh, to you, Father. And we, we know you've been good to us. And we just ask your blessing over Pastor Jeff's message and, uh, and over our worship. And uh, it is good to be in your house. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. These work better when they're on. How are you guys doing today? I get the privilege of being with you guys three weeks in a row. What? So awesome. The scripture that I want to uh, read this morning that I planned this set out of is Psalm 145 verse 8. And it says, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And every time I read this scripture, um, I'm so grateful that God is patient with me. I can't help but read this scripture and think of how much I fall short in this department as a father, that God, I heard it described this way one time, that God has a long wick before he gets angry. Like think of like a bomb, you know, you light it and you know, eventually it's gonna blow. But God has a long, long, long wick. It takes a long time before God gets so angry that he's going to act. And one day, friends, I mean, I don't wanna make the mistake of thinking God's never going to pour out his wrath on sin. He will one day. In fact, for those of us who are in Christ, he's already poured out his wrath on his sin, on sin, on our sin, when he poured out his wrath on Jesus Christ, when he took our place. But we serve a merciful and a patient, patient God who's slow, so slow today to get angry. In fact, sometimes in my prayers, I'm like, God, why are you taking so long? to act in this area. And the scripture tells us because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So his patience is actually an act of his mercy. So let's stand to our feet. I've got some songs that I want to sing and I don't know what situation you're coming into this room with. Maybe you're struggling with some sin. And you need to hear that we serve a patient and merciful God. Maybe you're struggling with sorrow. Maybe you're struggling with frustration with God himself. The good news is we serve a patient and a merciful God. So this first song is actually a call to ourselves. And it simply says this, bless the Lord, O my soul, O my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, O my soul, I'll worship your holy name. And the reason why I love this song is that sometimes you don't actually feel like blessing the Lord and you got to tell yourself, come on self, it's time to bless the Lord. Just come on self, I know you're struggling, I know you're struggling in sin, come on self, I know that you're suffering, I know that you're hurting but it's time to bless the Lord. So let's do that this morning. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawn. 
It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before let me be singing when the evening comes. Come on, let's bless the Lord and bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. It seemed like never before, oh my soul, I worship On. He's rich in love and slow to anger. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Amen. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Yes, I will. Come on. A thousand reasons for my heart to Find. And bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, and worship His holy name. Come on, church, sing it and sing like never before. Oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. And still my soul will sing your praise unending. Yes, it will. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. His holy name. Sing like never, sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. Come on, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. Fail me now, you won't fail me 
down even in the waiting the same God who's never late is working all things out you're working all things out come on say sing this yes I will lift you high Thou fount of every blessing To my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious song And song by flaming Songs above, praise the mount I'm fixed upon it. Mount of thy redeeming love. And here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come, and I hope by. Thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. And Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Precious blood. Come on, oh to grace. And oh to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy good like a fetter by my wandering heart to thee. I'm prone to wander, Lord, I fear. I'm prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Let's sing prone to wander. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for the courts of love. Stay in this attitude of worship and go ahead and have a seat. I want to think about that scripture one last time and think of some of those words from that hymn that we just sang. That song has the word, it says, 
Let the, your goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. And a fetter is like a chain or a rope. And in the SEMO house, we have, we have a puppy. And boy, is that puppy prone to wander. <laughs> You're like, this is awesome. I come to church and I get compared to a dog. This is great. Um, but it's true that when we go out on a walk, we put a leash on that dog to keep that dog close to us. Because the truth is that little puppy, our dog's name is Penny. She's not smart enough to realize when she's in true danger. Because if we didn't have that leash on her, she'd run out into the road, she'd chase this, this, she'd chase that, and she'd put herself in severe harm. And so that leash actually functions as a form of protection. And that's the way the love of God is for us. Because the truth is we are so prone to wander, but we serve a Lord that is gracious and merciful and slow to anger. Isn't that good news? And he's abounding in steadfast love. And so I thought it would be appropriate this morning to just bow our heads and maybe even for you to confess, what is the thing? What is that thing that so often you wander away towards? Confess that to him right now. Would you just thank him? Thank him for his gracious love, his goodness, that like a fetter, like a rope, like a chain, always brings you back to him. Thank him for that right now. and generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb and all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb and your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name it stands above them all above all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name it stands above them all and the angels cry Holy, all creation cries. Holy, and you are lifted high. Holy, you're holy forever. And if you've been forgiven, and if you've been redeemed, then sing the song forever to the Lamb. And if you walk in freedom, and if you bear His name, we'll sing the song forever to the Lamb. We'll sing the song forever. And you 
Come on, your name is the highest. He's the greatest. And your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name, it stands above them all. Above all thrones and dominions, all powers and positions. Your name, it stands above them all. And Jesus, your name, is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name, it stands above them all. Above your people sing holy to the king of kings holy you will always be holy holy forever heavenly father we join with all of creation saying you are holy. You are worthy of our praise and adoration and worship. And we're so grateful that you are a God that is so patient and compassionate and slow to get angry. Lord, we're so grateful for your steadfast love that continues to draw us back to you when we wander and oh boy, God, do we wander. I wander from you, but your love is always there to lovingly call me back to your loving care. We're so grateful for that. And we worship you today for the amazing God that you are. We pray all of this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. So. Only three weeks in a row. Come on. You're welcome every week, Andy. Come on. I know where you work. It's not too far away. Yeah. Oh, we are in for a special treat this morning. Pastor John Dayback, who is our pastor of our college ministry and young adults ministry, is going to be bringing God's word to us today. Come on up, John. Now, we are a little bit older young adults, but I'm, you know, I'm still looking forward to what you're going to have to say to us. Now, John, how long ago was it last time you taught for us? It's been a couple months. Uh, I think it was in... August. August, okay. You had a new addition to your family. That's right, Levi. Levi, and I think we have a recent picture. What do you think? Yeah, there he is. Oh, please. Look at that. Yeah, does he look happy or what? Now, I'm assuming you've already got him his first BB gun. That's right. Right, Okay, all right, good, all right. I'll turn stuff over to you. Thanks, John. (laughs) Yeah, that is my son, Levi. Uh, The last time you guys saw him, I think he had just recently kind of learned how to smile. And now he's recent, as of last night, he has started clapping, which is fun. So we'll, we'll give him a couple claps and then he'll clap back and he'll be very pleased with himself. Uh, but it's been really good. I'm so happy to be back uh, with you all. My wife and I are so thankful to be here at Canyon Hills and it is a delight and a joy to get to uh, serve the Lord alongside each of you as we seek to grow the kingdom here. Uh, in Seattle and in Bothell and wherever the Lord has placed us. And I hope that this message today is an encouragement to you to hold fast to our Savior Jesus, no matter what circumstances you may be in, no matter where you find yourself. But I, I hope that this message in Hebrews calls you to cling to your Savior. And as I was preparing this message, I was thinking through you know, what are, what are things that we hold fast to? What are the things uh, that we need to hold on to in life? And I realized for me, uh, back in high school, which is always a great way to start a story, uh, if you say back in high school, you, so whoever's listening to you, if you say, hey, back in high school, they know they're about to get a good story. 
Back in high school, uh, my best friend Carter and I uh, were going out to the lake. His parents were a part of a kind of a boat club, and so they could rent any boat. And so his dad thought it would be fun if he took Carter and I and his two brothers out on the lake, and he rented a tube. And the point of this tube that he hitched to the back of the boat was to see if he could either drown us or launch us into orbit. (laughs) That was his goal. So Carter, Cooper, and Tanner, Cooper and Tanner are his two brothers, they get on the tube first. Mr. Law, he's going to be steering the boat, and I'm sitting in the back, and my job is to tell them, tell Mr. Law how many of his sons he's managed to lose uh, and how fast he can do it. So I'm sitting there. i got a great view as I watch Carter, Cooper, and Tanner swim up to the tube. They get onto it, and there are these little plastic handholds at the top of this tube. And they'd swim up there, they'd crawl onto the tube, and then they would, you would watch them like try and anchor themselves as much as possible onto these little plastic grips because they had to hold onto those as hard as they could because they were going to be whipped around all over the place. And so they're trying to, to steady themselves, to anchor themselves on this, to hold as fast as they can to this. And once they're ready, they give a shout and he takes off in the boat. Starts pretty slow at first. He's just kind of moving around, picking up speed. The wake is getting larger. And then he starts whipping the boat around. And man, the sheer panic and terror in their eyes is something I'll never forget and always makes me laugh because it's hilarious. (laughs) I'm I'm thankful I'm not one of them. And then he was like, well, you're next. And I was like, I don't know. We'll see. They're holding fast. They're being whipped around. And my friend Carter starts trying to give some encouragement to his two brothers. You know, tell him to hold on, hold on, don't let go. And he looks to his left to tell his brother that. And as soon as he looks to his left, he just hears a faint scream (laughs) fading into the distance behind him as his brother has let go and has flown through the air. And he's surprised by this, so he starts yelling to his other brother to hold fast because we just lost Cooper. And he turns because he hasn't heard a reply yet, and that spot's already empty. He had had no idea his other brother had simultaneously been thrown off of the boat, uh, off of the raft as they were hitting these giant waves. And so then Carter, realizing that he's all alone, just looks up to me with this panic in his eyes, knowing the inevitable is about to happen to him. And sure enough, we hit this massive wave, and he just goes cartwheeling through the air. So high that I think that the National Guard got a blip on their radar. They're like, oh, uh uh-oh, got another UFO sighting here. This one came into orbit. He was gone. And I realized as I was preparing for this message that we are often whipped about in our lives. And there are things that we are hitting, waves of our life that we are hitting that are causing us to loosen our grip on our Savior. Or maybe causing us to become distracted and forget what we should be holding on to in the first place. I don't know what that might be for you. It might be a diagnosis for yourself or for a friend that you were hoping would never come. It might be how your children or your children's children are doing and how you see their life playing out. It could just be that you feel like you're missing that special presence that you once knew. I don't know what wave it is for you, but there are waves in life that we run into. And my encouragement and the encouragement of the word in Hebrews 2 is that we should hold fast to our Savior Jesus, that we should cling to Jesus. If you have your scriptures with you, open up to Hebrews 2. I'm going to be doing the one thing my seminary professors told me never to do, which is preach an entire chapter of Hebrews. Somewhere my... Greek professor had just got some heartburn or something. He's like, someone's doing it somewhere. Hebrews 2. These 18 verses are so encouraging and so good, but luckily enough, I don't have to read them all at once because it's all summed up in the first two. Hebrews 2, 1 through 2. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? 
Those few verses in Hebrews 2 set up the entire chapter, set up the entire encouragement for us to hold fast to Jesus. So look at this. It's a logical setup, and I really like the author of Hebrews because they're setting up a logical step for us, setting up a logical argument. It almost feels like, as I have been reading through Hebrews, it almost feels like a lawyer presenting a case, setting up how the supremacy of Jesus is greater than everything. And here he sets it up in Hebrews 2. Look at this. Part one is we must pay attention to what we have heard. Well, what have we heard? What is he talking about? What he's talking about is the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the Son of God came down, was born of a virgin in a humble home, poor, even fleeing his own country to Egypt and coming back, a foreigner to his own land, walking through life, building his life, walking the life that we walk in. Just like one of us, And he did so blamelessly. He did so perfectly without sin. And then he suffered death for our sake so that we could live. He died taking our sins upon himself, taking the wrath of God upon himself, having God turn his back on his own son so that we might be called sons and daughters of God. And he rose again from the grave declaring victory over sin and death itself and ascending to the right hand of the Father. And he will come again. That is the good news. That is what we have heard. That is what Hebrews is saying we must pay close attention to, that message. And if we pay attention, we will not drift away. What does drifting away mean? Drifting away is when we leave the faith or when we start neglecting the faith, when we start loosening our grip on those handholds, if you will. We must pay attention to what we have heard, and if we pay attention, we will not drift away. And so, logically then, to not drift away, we must hold fast. We must cling to Christ. We must hold on to Jesus, our Savior. That is the whole setup for Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2 is showing us that when we remember Christ's power, purpose, and person, we will cling to him. That's what the whole chapter goes through. Is Hebrews, the author of Hebrews, sets this up and he goes, you got to remember this. You have to pay attention to this. Don't let go of this. Don't neglect this. And then he shows us who this Jesus is. How wonderful and how mighty and powerful and good he is. And when we pay attention to those things, we will naturally want to hold fast to Jesus. The first part is seen in verses 5 through 8. For it was not to angels that that God subjected the world to come, of which we were speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Right there, the language used is that Jesus is all-powerful king of the universe. And when we think about that kind of power, How could we not hold fast to him? Recognizing that he has the power to meet every one of our needs. He is infinitely able to meet every one of your needs. Whatever that need may be, he's got the power and the authority to do it because everything is in subjugation to him. That sickness, that friendship, that family relationship, those finances, all things are in subjugation to him. And he has the power to deal with it. He has the authority to speak to it. And he has given us the invitation to bring it to him. That is how we can hold fast to Jesus' power. 
by laying our requests at his feet and asking him to do something about it. So often we let go of our knowledge of Christ's power and we feel hopeless in a situation. But when we remember his power, we will feel courage. We will feel strengthened, not because of ourselves, but because of his infinite power. When we hand over control to him, we recognize that he has it all. But when we hold something behind our back, it starts to feel heavy because we're just not strong enough to hold on to it. When we take time to stop, to really pause in the moment of your struggle, to dwell on the power of Christ, your situation will seem much smaller. Not gone, but securely placed in his hands. So often we go so quickly through our troubles. We, we want to get it done. We want to see it finished. We want to put it into our own control because then we can check that email. We can check that box. We can take care of that meeting. And if we can just get it done, get it done, get it done, we'll see it through to the end. But in reality, he's asking us to just place it in his hands, to take time to pray, to trust his power, to put our whole faith in him in whatever and every situation we're in. Nothing is outside of his control. It's all in the palm of his hand. You remember that song, he's got the whole world in his hands? It is true, he's got the whole world in his hands, but what I love about our God is that he cares for us so much that he's got your whole life in his hands. Not just the world on a big scale, blanket statement, but you individually, perfectly in his hands. Your situation, your trouble, your worry, your anxiety perfectly in his hands with all the attention that he can have on it because he is infinitely able, he is infinitely powerful to be able to focus that specifically on just you. And that is true for every person in this room. How wonderful is that, that he's that powerful and that he cares that much. And when we think about that power, we will naturally hold fast to him. We will naturally cling to Christ when we remember his infinite power. But it doesn't stop there. That sounds kind of like that Billy Mays commercial, right? But that's not all. There's more. Verses 9 through 16. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should, not, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death. That is the devil. And deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps. But he helps the offspring of Abraham. This is Christ's purpose. The whole mission of our Jesus was to make you and I co-heirs with him. Was to restore us to what we were always created to be. Sons and daughters of the living God without fear, without pain, without death, but in pure perfection, with joy everlasting. That was what we were made for, till we decided apples tasted really good. <laughs> but that's what we were made for, and that's what Christ came back for, was to redeem us back to that spot so that revelation could be proven true where it says there will come a day where it's all made right again. 
because we will get to be co-heirs, sons and daughters of God. So often we, we forget why he really came. We forget what his mission was, this mission of redemption, not just, again, blanket statement, but for you individually, that you will be a son and a daughter of the living God. That he doesn't look at you as less than he looks at you as equal to Christ, which is insane to me. Because I feel so far. I feel so imperfect. But through Christ's blood, the reality is we are co-heirs with Christ. And I love this language. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. Not ashamed. How amazing is that? Because so often when I think of my sin, I'm filled with nothing but shame. And I can't believe that the God of the universe would have such mercy and compassion on me that he would give up the one thing that he didn't have another of so that he could unashamedly call me son call you son, call you daughter. This purpose calls us to cling to our Savior Jesus, to cling to our Christ. Because how could we neglect such a love? For us individually, how could we neglect such a sacrifice made for us on the cross? How could we forget that? How could we take our eyes off of that kind of love and turn to some other worldly love? How could we fix our eyes on something other than our Jesus? When we remember this purpose, when we remember what he has done for us, then we will cling to Christ. How could you ignore such a wonderful, wonderful love? How could I? Do not neglect the fact that he came to bring you back to life. Don't go back to that grave. Dirt is comfortable and it's all we knew. But now we have life. And we can walk in the light as he is in the light. And we can have life and as he says, life abundantly and to the fullest. Cling to that, hold fast to that, because that was his purpose to bring us his life, to bring us new life. Cling to his purpose. And his personhood is what Hebrews 2 ends with. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. That final one is such an encouragement for us to hold fast to Jesus. Because he gets it. He did not stay far away from us. He could have. He could have just stayed in heaven and said, you know what, stop sinning. Just don't do it. He could have said, you guys are fools. How could you do that? Mm. What did he do instead? He experienced everything that we experience so that we would know that our Savior understands our struggle. He knows exactly what it's like to have family abandon you. He knows exactly what it's like for his friends to let him down. He knows exactly what it's like to fear and to hurt. He knows what it's like to sweat to the point that he sweated blood. He knows what it's like to be obedient even when we want something else. He understands us, doesn't he? He was even tempted 
just as we are tempted. His personhood is such an encouragement. When we know, when we think about, when we dwell on, and when we know that he gets it, that he knows exactly what it's like to walk as us, we will hold fast to him because he's trustworthy, because we know that he sympathizes with our weakness. He understands us. And he's patient. He doesn't get angry with us. He doesn't get frustrated when we struggle. He says, oh, I know. Bring it to me. Bring it to me. You saw a little picture of Levi there. He started crawling about a month ago. And he struggles and he struggles. You know, but I don't get upset when he falls over. I'm proud of him. I know what it's like to, to be, become frustrated with the situation. Levi, he gets frustrated with his situation and he starts to cry a little bit. I, I don't get upset with him for that. What do I do? I pick him up and I hold on to him because I get it. If that is true with me, a sinful father, how much more so is it true with our perfect father? And through Jesus, he gets it. Jesus walked this life like we walked it. He, he has experienced the whole range of human emotion for the exact purpose of being a merciful and faithful high priest for us. Again, he did it for us. Motivated by a love for us. How incredible is that? That his desire would be to be a merciful and faithful high priest and so he understands that he has to be made like his brothers in every respect, like his sisters in every respect. So that we could hold fast to him knowing that he understands what it's like. Now if you've been watching closely, you'll notice that I skipped a few verses in Hebrews 2. I skipped verses three through four because I, I figured that's actually a really good place to end the message. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord and it was attested to by us who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. I know that I've given the gospel in this message. I know that I have given you the whole layout of who Jesus is and how his power, purpose, and personhood could, can call us to cling fast to him. What's left up to you is the question of, are you holding fast? Are you clinging to Christ? Or are there little waves coming to cause you to neglect it? How, could, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? You can almost hear the anguish in the author's voice. How could we neglect this? And he says you have all the information that you could possibly need. He goes, you have the angels, you got the prophets, you got those of us who walked with Jesus, who heard it from the apostles. Then you saw it by signs and miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit to his people. He goes, how could, how could you neglect all this? And that was, two, that was about 2,000 years ago. How much more have we seen since then? The continuation of this church against all odds and against all opposition. How many more miracles? How many more answered prayers that only he could do? How many more gifts of the Spirit have been given? How many more things have testified to his goodness? How could we neglect such a great salvation? How could we want to cling to other things? Things that will fade away in the end. Do not neglect the truth. Do not neglect this wonderful message brought to us by our Savior. This wonderful message of hope, of clinging to him. Now we can rely on his power because he's offering it. He's infinitely able to do so.
This is this great message of his purpose of making us co-heirs with him. This great message of his personhood that he understands where we are. How could we neglect all of that on top of it? We get to meet freely like this multiple times a week without fear. What, what a privilege that is. So many of our brothers and sisters around the world would long for an opportunity. Jeff's email is publicly listed. You can email him any question you want any time. So is mine also, but his also. <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> but honestly, we, we have the joy that we get to walk alongside you. We, we can help answer any question. We can meet any prayer. We can pray with you. We can walk with you. We can talk with you. We can help point you to the Lord in a time of trouble. You have the entire internet at your fingertips. In your pocket or at home, you could Google any kind of verse. If you're thinking, oh, where is that? I'm not, not quite sure. You can look it up at any time. You can take whole classes about scripture online. There are free seminary courses. I wish someone had told me that like a few years ago. That would have been nice. We have no excuse to neglect such a great salvation. Yet so often that wave just seems too high. We're on that tube of life and we just think, gosh, I don't know if I can anymore. What tempts you to neglect? Maybe it's the people in your life. Oh, if you only knew the people that I had to deal with, you'd understand why I'm letting go a little bit. Well, Jesus had to deal with Judas and he was still patient. He didn't lose sight. Maybe it's the pride. We live in a culture that is very individualistic. I remember in the short time that I was in the army, one of the things our first sergeant loved to say was pick yourself up by your bootstraps. You got an issue? Figure it out yourself. That's our culture. Fix it yourself. We have the pride of thinking that we can solve every problem alone. Don't let that bleed into our, your faith. Because it's all on him. It's all about surrender. Don't neglect this wonderful, wonderful Jesus because of some pride. Don't neglect his power because you have the pride that you can do it yourself. Don't neglect his purpose because you think you can save yourself. Don't neglect his personhood because you think that you're an island in and of yourself. He gets it. Don't neglect the truth. Or maybe, maybe it's some sin that you've hidden deep in your heart. If, if anyone ever knew about this thing or if I ever confessed it to the Lord, then he would surely put me away. Do not neglect the truth that he is unashamed of you. That he saw every one of your sins, past, present, future, and he looked, he looked at them and he did not flinch and he took the cross for your sake. Do not neglect that. Don't let sin pull you away from holding fast to Christ. He is faithful and just to forgive. His mercy triumphs over judgment. How wonderful is that? Just like Andy said, he's got a long wick. Don't let some sin prevent you from knowing his mercy and his faithfulness to forgive. Or maybe, maybe you feel a little too busy. There's a lot going on. You got a lot of things to do. And you, at the end of the day, you just want to relax. You don't want to do anything. And so we fill ourselves with entertainment or busy work. And so often that pulls us away from our Savior. It pulls us away from holding fast to him as we try and put a million things into our hands, as we try and juggle a million little balls of our life. Don't become so busy you forget to hold fast to your Savior. 
Now, this is all well and good to say cling to Christ, but how do you practically do that? I'm so glad you asked. Great question. (laughs) Hebrews goes on to say in chapter 4 that the word is sharper than any two-edged sword, that it pierces joint and marrow. One of the best ways to cling to Christ, to hold on to our Jesus, is to be in his word. Be in his word. Be in his word. Be in his word. And when you are in his word, you will know more of himself. And when you discover more of himself, you understand how much more you can hold on to. You may not know what tomorrow holds, but if you know the one who holds tomorrow, then you're fine. And when you're, in your, when, in your, when you're in his word, you will see that played out time and time and time again to remind us and to call us to hold fast to him. Be in prayer. My goodness, I, I know that this is a room of prayer warriors. Man, I love that. I wish more of my young adults would understand what you do about the power of prayer. Pray, bring the request to him. So often the things that pull us away are because we're not willing to bring it to him in the first place. That is another wonderful way to hold fast to our Savior is to bring him the request. He's got the power, ask him to do something. I'd be really frustrated if Levi came to me and he, he can't talk yet, so I'd be really scary if he did. <laughs> but later down the road... If he came to me and said, you know, I, I, I wish you would have done this three months ago. And I'm like, why didn't you ask? I would have at least considered it. And if it was something genuinely good, I would have given it to you. And if it wasn't good, then I would have found the better thing. Maybe not in your timing, but in the timing that was best for you. How often do we go to the Lord and we say, why didn't you do anything? And he goes, why didn't you ask? Why didn't you ask? Be in prayer. Make the request. Be in fellowship. What a beautiful room this is. As Hebrews again goes on to say, do not neglect meeting together. Fellowship is such a wonderful way for us all to hold fast to Jesus together. You don't want to be on a tube by yourself like Carter found out. (laughs) You want that person to your left and your right that you can get encouragement from to keep holding fast. So keep meeting together. Not just on a Tuesday morning or a Sunday morning, but as often as you can. And again, the internet. Mixed bag sometimes. It can be a blessing, can be a curse, but focus on the blessing that it can allow you to be a prayer partner with anyone you need, with a friend who couldn't make it. You can check in on them at any time. You can be asking for prayer requests at any time. You can use the internet for good. (laughs) As hard as that is to believe these days. But you can be in fellowship. And finally, the one that I think is so important that we so often forget is confession. Take time to confess. It's like prayer in a way. The Lord already knows. But in prayer, he says, I want you to be a part of the process. Bring the question to me so that you can see me work specifically. He invites us into the process. In confessing, he invites us into the process. He already knows the sin, but he invites you into the process of redemption and restoration to himself. So take time to do that. And when you bring that sin and you feel his forgiveness and you see his mercy played out, you'll hold fast to him all the more. You'll hold fast to him all the more. We know all of these things probably intellectually. You've heard this message probably a million different ways. But allow it to make the journey from your head to your heart. It's not a far one, but it seems impossibly long sometimes. We need to practice these things. And he is patient with us. He knows it takes practice. He knows it takes time. But start practicing. I was talking to my mentor about this message and he said, John, so often people hear something like this and they already know it intellectually but then they don't live it. 
And he challenged me to think of my own heart. And he said, if you know this truth in your head, intellectually, you're walking in faith. And he said, but is your heart set closer to that of an atheist or to of a believer? How does your life actually look in light of this? I said, well, geez, that's convicting. All right, I'll just take some time. But he's patient. He's infinitely able. He has made us co-heirs. And we can start walking in, that, in the example that he set for us. And I love that scripture says that, to walk in the example he set for us. Because it is a walk. It's not a sprint. It is a journey. And it takes many steps. But he is faithful. He will see us through. The good work he has begun, he will see to the finish. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. That it is alive. That it is sharper than any two-edged sword. And that it does convict us, that it encourages us to hold fast to you, that it teaches us who you are, how powerful you are, what you have come to do, and how you have walked as one of us. Thank you. Thank you. Would you help us to walk in the example that you've set for us? Would you help us to hold fast to you? Lord, there are so many distractions like Peter getting out of the boat, would you help us keep our eyes fixed on you and not look to the left or to the right? Would you help us cling to you amidst the waves of life, the things that toss us to and fro? Would you help us hold fast to you? I'm so thankful that you have given us the Spirit. Would you help us hold fast through the power of the Spirit to our dear Savior? Lord, we want to know your power. We want to rest in the fact that we have been made co-heirs. And we are so thankful that you understand us and meet us where we're at. Would you help us hold fast to you? In the name of our Jesus, we pray. Amen. I've got some questions for you here that you guys can discuss at your tables. I hope that it is something that allows you to take it, the conversation to the next step of how can we walk this out in our daily lives. I've been so blessed to be with you all. Hope you have a great rest of your morning. Okay, so it's time for a little talk around the table. Here's question number one. And what, what a great message. And John, that's the perfect setup for where we're headed next week as we dive back into First Peter. But here's question number one. What tends to encourage you the most that, that Pastor um, John talked about? Christ's person, his power, or his purpose? What tends to encourage you the most? Go ahead and talk around the table. I'll give you a second question in a couple minutes. Okay, so here's our, here's our second question. What are things that help you cling to Christ? What are some things that help you cling to Christ? Pastor John gave us some great examples. Now you can talk about that around the table for a couple minutes, and then I'll close this out. Okay, all right. Man, what a great, again, what a great message and a perfect setup for where we're headed next week. Now here's the primary truth about Jesus that we have to cling to. And it's our memory verse for this week, John 14, six. And these are Jesus words himself. We can put that up on the screen. Let's say this together. John 14, six. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, six. That is the truth we all have to obviously cling to. Now, if you didn't pick up your February newsletter yet, you can get one on the way out. Um, I just remind you to look at, the, look at the screen before and after the service for our announcements. A couple big things we want to remind you about. First thing is this. Ooh, Friday, March 8th. Are you ready for this? At 9 o'clock, we're getting together for pancake breakfast. Oh, and it's, it costs 12 bucks because we got to pay for it. Um, and you can sign up online or at the table over there. But we're going to have some pancakes and bacon. Exactly. Bacon makes everything better. So anyhow, there you go. And then the second thing, just a little early heads up. We are going back to the tulip fields up in Mount Vernon. Uh, and enjoying the blooming tulips. But not for a little while. We're going to be jumping on the bus, I think, April 17th. If I got that right, April 17th, 
We'll give you some more info later. And next week, I'm sorry, but I'm back on. Ugh, uh. And we are going to be looking at the war of the worlds that we see in 1 Peter 2, verses 11 and 12. It's such an important message. I'd encourage you to come. Come ready to um, be convicted by God's word. And don't come alone. Bring somebody with you. So good to have to be able to get together with you today. And we'll have a couple of our prayer team members up front if you'd like to be prayed for after the service. But again, John is hanging out in the back of the room. Thank you so much, Pastor John. You did just an awesome job. Thank you. Yeah. We'll see you next week. We'll see you next week.